So there, there are several ways of doing this. I could either just uh, click the picture down here to open the, uh, the park file, or I could use the open uh, button up here and choose the park file here, and then open. And the, the reason I'm opening the part file is just so that it's going to be automatically selected for, for the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, drawing when I'm uh, starting that one. And first off, the very first thing I see as soon as I go in there, I see that we forgot something uh, last week. We haven't set the material of it because it says all the way at the top here, it says generic, and this one wasn't supposed to be generic, so I need to check here. It's supposed to be ABS plastic. So I'm going to open the drop-down folder, I'm going up to the top, and all the way at the top, there's the ABS plastic. So I switch to that one, and it turns a brighter shade of gray, basically. So. Uh, yeah, the, the, the ABS plastic uh, can often come in whatever color you want. Uh, I'm pretty sure that uh, the Lego pieces are made from ABS plastic, so that you can get it basically in whatever color you want. In this case, the color is here. If we had decided that we wanted a different color, we could have gone to the next one over there and cho chosen another color there, basically. But the color doesn't matter to us. We're just going to make a technical drawing right now. So I go to the new button up in the corner. I press it. And since I've just started up the uh, inventor program for today, it's all the way up at the templates folder. I don't want that one. I want to go to the metric one. The metric folder. And I want the iso.idw. It's not, it's not really a big deal if you choose the DWG one, but the DWG one isn't exactly the correct format. So it's the IDW that's the correct format for an Inventor drawing. That's the, that's the internal format for, for Inventor. So that's why we're using it. You, you, using DWG might cause some problems later on if you're doing something special. So you. It's uh, just to be on the safe side, we're using IDW uh, at all times. So I see uh, some people just need to catch a bit up, so I'm just going to give them a chance. So I've found the iso.idw one. So I click create. My computer is a bit slow today, but that's, that's just the way it is. Uh, we're going to place the base first. And since I've opened up the IPT file, the plate with holes.ipt as it's named in my, my project, it's going to automatically select it when I choose the base view here. So you see here it's already chosen the correct file there. What it hasn't chosen is to show it correctly. Uh, I don't want it to be shown from, from the side like this. I want to look straight onto the plate. So I'm going to tilt it to the top. I can also see that it has chosen the style where it's showing hidden lines. 
which is going to be a bit of a problem once I use a projected view to show from the side and give the, uh, to give the thickness of the plate. So I'm going to choose the one beside it, which says hidden line removed right away. Then I don't have to go back in to, to fix it afterwards. And I'm also going to look a bit at the scale because it seems quite tiny uh, on my drawing right now. So I'm going to try the scale of one to one. That looks a lot better. I think we can go for one to one. We're, we're going to have enough room to put our, uh, uh, all of our uh, dimensions in here. So then, for the last part, I'm going to place a projected view on the side here so that I can give the thickness of it. Once I've done that, I click the OK button. I don't want my base view to be in the middle of the drawing. That's going to, uh, to create a lot of problems for me with, with regards to space for my dimensions. So I'm going to click and drag it further up towards the corner. I can move uh, the projected view a bit closer also. <clears throat> now before I start putting in dimensions on this one, I want to show where the symmetry line is, and I also want to show the center points of each of my holes. So I'm going to go to the, the annotate parts of the toolbars. Annotate up there. Then I'm going over to the side of the symbols where we have center line, which is the one we use to show a symmetry line also. So I choose center line, and I'm going to click. I'm just going to choose this line because it's automatically, automatically going to place the center line in the midpoint of the line. So I choose the top line, and then the bottom line there, and it has placed the center line. But it hasn't placed it completely yet because I have to right click my mouse, and then press create, or else it just wants to continue placing points on my center line. <coughs> then I go to the center mark. I switch to that one, and I'm going to put the center mark on all of the eight holes. So I think I'm going to, to just show this to, to everyone, just so that you know it. So I need to go back to my home view here just for a little while. Uh, sometimes when you sit down at a new computer that you haven't used before, when you open your projects, it won't show any of your projects here. But that's just because you haven't worked on that particular computer before. So the way you find your project then is to use the browse button down here. So when you open the browse button, you get the explorer up. 
and then you go to the go to the correct uh, folder and then you find the correct task you want so for an example here now we're in 2a and then you just choose the project file for the correct task and then it's going to end up in the list so that you get it activated But if you're sitting on a computer that you've worked on before, then you're probably going to have your projects already in the list there. So I'll go back to my uh, drawing here. So it's about time we start filling in dimensions here. So I click the dimension function up in the corner there. And I go straight off over to the format side. And I choose method 1B, ISO. Usually, when you're working in, uh, in a company, the company has predetermined uh, the formatting and everything. So everything is set from the get go. So you don't have to do this choosing method 1B each time that you're going to place a dimension. So it's a, it's a lot easier when you're actually working in a company because you have set rules of how things are going to look like, and those are uh, usually programmed into your inventor so that the first time you start inventor, it's going to act the way the, the company wants it to act. <clears throat> so now I have the dimension function open. I've switched to method 1B. And I'll start by putting dimensions, uh, horizontal dimensions, between the holes here and the outer edge. And I only need to give dimensions for these holes because we have a symmetry line here, so the dimensions are mirrored on the other side. So I don't need to give those. So I'm giving from the outer edge. And now it's important to give, to choose the vertical line in the center mark when you're clicking, even though it's marking the entire center mark red. If you click on the horizontal line, it's going to give you a 90 degree angle between, between uh, the outer edge and the center mark. You don't want that, so you're clicking the horizontal, the, the vertical line in order to get a dimension. I pull this one down here and place it as the first dimension. Click OK. Then again, I go from the outer edge and I go to the next hole. I'm choosing the vertical part of the center mark. And I'm placing the dimension. Now I'm going to do the same for the vertical uh, dimensions of the holes. So I go to the, the bottom line of the plate, click it, and now I need to mark the horizontal parts of the center mark. So I click the center mark. I place the dimension, click OK. Again, the lower part of the plate, up to the horizontal line in the center mark, click it and place the dimension. So now I'm going to give the entire length of the plate and then it's uh, enough to just click on the bottom line because it's going to give the entire length of it. Place that dimension and I'm going to do the same to the uh, vertical edge of the plate. So I'm going to click this part of it, place the dimension. Click OK. But now I also want to get the length from uh, the height from the bottom and to the top of the plate. So then I need to choose the bottom line and then the top line here. And I place the dimension. So now all of my dimensions uh, in this case are Go, coming from basically this corner. So now everything has been dimensioned so far from that corner. 
The problem now is uh, I can't continue dimensioning from that corner. That's going to be really messy if I do that. So now I have to start moving off in order to place dimensions. And the first one I'm going to place is the width of this slot in the middle. So I go from one side and to the other, and I place the dimension. And while I'm at it, I'm also going to give the height of that slot. And then I can just click on one of the sides and place the dimension in there. The reason I'm placing the dimension inside the slot is because if I pull it out to the outside, it's going to be really messy with a lot of lines here. And that's going to be uh, more difficult to read. So it's easier to read if I'm putting the dimension inside the slot right now. So we need one more thing. We need to know the length of this angled line. And there are two ways that we can give it. We can either give the total length from this point and to that point across the symmetry line, or we can give the length from the edge and to that point. I think I'm going to put the length from uh, across the symmetry line here instead. So I go to the end point there. It's marked with green. Click that one, and I go to the other endpoint, which also gets marked with green, and then I place my dimension. Now we know where to place all of the holes. We know the outer dimensions of the plates. But we also need to put in the thickness of the plate. And in this case, it's really easy to, to hit either the uh, midpoint or one of the edges of, uh, of the lower line there. So it might be wise to zoom in, just to make it a bit easier to, to click on the line there. Because if you're zoomed all the way out here, you'll see that it's, it's pretty difficult to avoid that green dot when you're going to place it. So zoom in. Click the line, and then you can zoom out before you place it. So I place the 5 there. I'm just going to zoom, zoom and center it. So now we have all of the linear dimensions we need to create it. Now we need some information about the holes. And one way we could do this is just to continue using the dimension function set the, di uh, the diameter of one hole and just write tip behind it because then all of the eight holes would have the same diameter. But we're really not showing clearly uh, that the holes are going straight through. Even though it's a five millimeter plate, so it's very, uh, very likely that the holes are going all the way through, we're not showing it anywhere. We don't have a section through the plate showing that the holes go all the way through. So we'll instead use the hole and thread function Now click on one of the one of the holes. The reason I chose this hole instead of that hole is basically just to get a better location for my for my dimension. But as you can see now, that doesn't look all that good. I want the method one B formatting on it. So as soon as I click on that one, it makes sure that the dimension itself is horizontal instead of being along the line. So I'm placing this one up here. And in my case, it says through behind, which means that it's going all the way through because I chose distance through all when I uh, made my holes. If you've set your distance to be exactly five millimeters so that the, the hole goes exactly through, it's go probably going to say depth five millimeters or something like that. But that's not a problem because the plate is five millimeters. So the, the, the real point is that it says something about the depth of the hole. So whether that is five millimeters, which is equal to the, the plate's thickness, or whether it says through, that doesn't really matter. So I'm going to exit the hole and thread function, and now I'm going to add some information in there. So I'm going to click it, double click it in order to get in there. And I'm going all the way to the start here. And then I'm going to choose the quantity note, which I'm going to put in. 
And as soon as I press my OK button now, it says eight times 20 millimeter holes straight through. And sometimes when you create, uh, cr create uh, patterns like this, if you've chosen to put every single hole in, uh, uh, it's only going to say one hole. But one thing you can do then is to go back in. And then you have this option down here which says edit quantity note. So basically if you haven't used the rectangular pattern and the mirror function in order to place them, if you placed each hole individually, you can do the edit quantity note, and then you can choose instead of giving the quantity of the number of holes in that pattern, you give the number of uh, equal holes in the view. So then it's going to do all of the holes that are 20 millimeters that it can see in this view instead. So then you will get your eight times uh, 20 millimeter holes. So we've gotten most of the dimensions in. I can't see anyone that's missing right now. The proper thing would be to, to uh, pull up the checklist and go through it and see that have I remembered everything uh, in, the, uh, in the views themselves. But we basically don't have time to do that in the lectures. So that's something you'll have to do when you're working on your own to actually go through the checklist. But now I want to put in the information above the title box. So I'll start off with the parts list in order to show which material we are working with here. So I go up to the parts list up top here. I select one of my views. Each of the views are of the same part file, so it doesn't really matter which one I press. And then I press the OK button. And I, for now, just place my uh, uh, part list down in the corner here. <clears throat> and then we're going to double click it in order to, to edit it. So I go to the top here where it says table layout, because I don't, I don't need it to say a parts list, have a title there. You want the title of parts list if you have more than one part, of course, but in this case where we only have one, we don't need it. So I uncheck it and press OK. And then I go to the first button there which says column chooser. I remove all of the selected properties in here. The item, quantity, part number and description. Then I go to the available properties and I find the one named material. And I add this one. Then I press OK. Quantity, I don't know. Well, we only have one plate, we just need to know what it's made of. 
Because we don't want the description, we don't want what the final is, we don't want what the final is, we don't want the final is, we don't want the final is, it's just one, so we just can still go around and see the final is, yeah, the description that we want to have. So, any questions? Yeah, I'll change it, so that's what's good. Yeah, we will have it. So if you want them back, you just press it and add, okay? So now we have the material, so press the material. One up. Yeah. You press that. So now we can get that information about the material. So okay. If you press apply, so as long as it says the but we don't want to say So that's where we get the table and Once that is done, we press OK. And now we suddenly have a really small table here. It says material, ABS plastic. We're going to just drag it down into the corner where it snaps into place. And then we're going to place the uh, tolerances notes in here. We just have to see what, what we're, su we're supposed to have here. Yeah. Um, in order to place the tolerances note, we need to use the text option, which basically creates a text box for us. So I select that one, and I just click somewhere in this area, because I'm going to have to move it afterwards anyway, just when I see where the text is going to be. So I click there, and I get this one open, so I can start writing in my text. So I write general. Uh, tolerances and surface finish. Can I start a new line? So I'm going to, on the next line here, I'm going to write the actual general, but the surface finish is going to be placed as a symbol afterwards, so after we have placed the text box. So now, I, now I'm uh, going to write in the ISO, it's 2768-1, and this is the ISO giving the general tolerances for linear dimensions and uh, angles, I think it is. And in this case, we want to use a fine tolerance on this one. So it means that they have to be extra careful when they're machining it. And then I continue on with ISO 2768-2. And this standard gives uh, the uh, tolerances for straightness, perpendicularity, parallelism, and everything like that. So uh, the more geometrical uh, tolerances. And in this case, we wanted to use H, which is the equivalent of the fine one. So we are putting... Uh, putting quite a lot of constraints on, on uh, whoever is going to machine this plate, so they, they have to be very thorough when they're doing their job. So we press OK, and now I can see how much the text is going to, uh, to cover. So I can exit the text box function, and then I can drag and pull it down to, to right above the title box. So now I have the general tolerances, but I also need surface finish here. And in order to put in the surface finish, I go up to the symbols part up there, and I choose the one named surface, which means that this 
looks almost like a check mark, is following my uh, mouse pointer around. And I'm going to attach that one. It doesn't automatically snap uh, to the uh, top line of the title box, but put it as uh, good as you can on top of the title box, and it is going to snap to it afterwards once you've placed it. So I click once on the left mouse button, and then I click once on the right mouse button, and continue because then it's placed. Because if you click once on the left mouse button and then you move your mouse pointer, you're going to, I can actually show that. You're going to place it and then you can move it off and have a line with an arrow on instead. So it's possible to, to not have it attached to, to the actual line. <clears throat> so now we're on the surface uh, finish symbol and in this case we want to since we have placed these very fine tolerances on them uh, so the manufacturer needs to be very careful of what they do when they are creating it we also want to make sure that they are going to to machine all surfaces so we put in removal of material required so they have to they have to actually remove uh, a small part of the material even though they have a plate which is actually five millimeters straight from their supplier. They actually have to just shave off a micrometer or two of the surface. And that's uh, because they need to get this uh, surface finish that we are going to, to set. So, so they need to have uh, specific settings on their milling machine as they are shaving off this very thin layer. And what we're going to put in is RA, so capital R, lowercase a. And then we're going to put in 6.3. So the RA stands for using the arithmetic mean of these sort of mountain tops and valleys uh, on the microscopic surface of the of the uh, material. Uh, so we're using the, the mean value of it, and it's going to be 6.3 uh, micrometers. <coughs> If you use the R set, you are telling what the highest mountain peaks are allowed to be. So that's what we used on, on the first, first practice task. On this one, we're using RA. Uh, in my experience, RA is what's usually used out there on your machining stuff, but some uh, businesses use R set also. So we put in 6.3. That is uh, sort of mid-range on uh, machining uh, equipment. It means that they can have uh, a fair speed when they're when they're machining it without destroying the surface finish, uh, making it rougher than it's supposed to be. So if you're, if you're down to 3.2 or something, it's going to be a very fine finish, so they have to slow down the speed of their machines or else they're going to make a too rough surface on them. So we click OK, and then we get the symbol up here, all nice and ready. We're going to create a new text box because we're going to make some notes down in the corner here. So I'm just going to write in notes, and my first and only note in this case is that they are to break sharp edges 0 0.2 millimeters in a 45 degree angle. And in order to get the degree symbol, you have this part here where you can insert symbols that are not on your keyboard. So you can click this one to get a degree symbol. And even though this is made of plastic, a plastic plate, if you are machining this one and you're not, and you're not uh, treating any of the sharp edges, you can still cut your fingers on it. So even though it's not steel or anything like that, uh, it's just soft plastic basically, you can still cut your fingers on it, just like you can get a paper cut from, from a piece of paper. So, so that's why we are telling them to break the sharp edges so that they will just slightly grind them. Maybe they only use sandpaper on them by hand just to, just to get that uh, initial sharpness off. So I exit the text box function and then I just drag it down into the corner. I've already put in a lot of restrictions on the manufacturer with putting fine tolerances on it and I don't feel the need of giving them anything else here. So. But it is possible to put in 
extra notes telling them uh, more about exactly how they are going to do their work. And that's, uh, that's fair enough if you have a good reason to do it, but you shouldn't be, uh, you should, you shouldn't be too, too eager to put in uh, directions on how to create uh, the stuff, because usually the guys running the manufacturing companies know, know a lot better than you how they're going to make it uh, to your specifications. So unless that you have a particular reason why they are going to do something, uh, then you're not going to put it in there, because they, they, they know how to do it already. Now we need to put in uh, information in our title field. Then we go over to the, uh, the tree over on the side of the browser tree. We click the one that says ISO and you can even see in, in the icon there, it's, uh, it has sort of highlighted the title box. And we're going to open it up so that we get the field text into view here. And then we right click and edit field text. So then we get this one up. If you can't see all of the different lines here, I would advise you to, to drag the window a bit more open so that you can see all of the lines. And then in order to, to edit them, we need to click the button up here. And now we need to go through all of the tabs to try to, to find where all of this different information is, and then we need to fill it in. So title, again, I've been uh, lax in saving, so I haven't saved it yet, so it's not been given a part number or a title. So I just have to write in plate with holes. I go down to author, and I just, I can either fix my initials to be capital letters, or I can write in my student number. For your submissions, you have to use your student numbers, so you might as well just get used to doing it uh, on everything. Company, put in a fictitious company or just put in the name of the school. The part number should be the same as the name of the file in this case, since we're not running with specific part numbers when we're doing stuff. So I'm just going to write in plate with holes there. Revision number, this is the first, uh, first edition of this drawing, so it's the first revision. So either 0, 01 or A would be appropriate. I'm used to working with, uh, letter, uh, with uh, letters when we are uh, doing revisions. <coughs> and we go to status, check by, I'm going to put in Torbjorn again. And approved by Einar. And then I'm also going to check the date uh, below the approver, because the date will be shown in the title field. So now I press the OK button. And now I can check here that everything has been filled in. So that if, if I press the OK button and uh, one of these wasn't filled in, I would have to go back into the properties part and try to figure out where it was. And you can also see that it's filled in everything down here also. So then I click the OK button. And now this drawing is done. So now it's high time to save it before Inventor crashes. So I'm saving it with the same name as the part file. Save and OK. That window that just came up there with the, uh, where I had to press OK once more. It was just telling me that it was going to save, save the part file also, since I had changed the material there. So it was just telling me that it was saving both files at once, since they are connected to each other. Then we are done with practice task two. And just as the break is starting, so I think we'll, we'll do a 15 minute break and then we'll start on uh, practice task three afterwards. Okay, then we'll continue on with uh, practice task three. And this one looks like this. So it's, uh, it has three holes and then it has a counter bore in, in the center hole also. So I'm going to first off create a new project for it. So 
I'm opening my uh, project and I'm clicking the new one. And I'm using the new single user project. Click next. Now I'm going to choose the correct folder or create the correct folder. So I go into my H drive on the server. I go into my lecture folder. And now I'm going to create a new folder here, which will be practice task 3A in this case. And again, the folder hasn't actually been chosen, even though I've created a new one. So I'm going to click on another one, and then back to the one I just created in order to get the name in here. And I click OK. And I also need to fix the project name. Practice task 3A, so I give it the same name as uh, the project folder. And then I click finish. And I just quickly check that practice task 3A has, been, uh, has the black check mark beside it, so that it's the active project. Then I click done. So now we're going to create this plate, which is uh, fairly quickly done, so hopefully we'll get to the drawing also today. I don't think we'll finish the drawing, but we'll at least start it. And I'm going to the new button up there, the blank sheet. Click it. This is a new project, so now I have to choose the metric folder again. And I'm going to use a standard in millimeter part file. And then I'll use the create button to create it. So I need to place my first sketch. So open the corner and start 2D sketch. And as usual, I prefer using the horizontal plane when I'm placing it. So I'm going to place it there. And for some reason, it meant to always tilts the view 90 degrees when you choose that plane. So I'm going to tilt it back again. That. <clears throat> and for this one, we can't really use the, uh, the uh, functions that we used until now. We basically used uh, rectangles and lines when we've created stuff up until now. But now we need to, we need to start off with uh, placing a, a, uh, a construction line across the center here, just to get the distance between the holes. So I choose the line function up there. And I'm going to mark the construction line part, just to get this one out there. And I'm going to attach it to the center point here. I also want it to lock into being horizontal. So now I'm just placing it there. Clicking OK to exit. And then I and then I remove the option of using construction lines because I don't want to put any more construction lines in yet. Now I need to lock the construction line into place. So first off, I'm going to give it the correct dimension. So for the drawing, it says that the length between the holes is, between the center hole and the side hole is 90. So in this case, I want the line to be two times 90. If I want to create the entire one. It is fully possible here to just to just create one quarter of the plates and then use a double mirror function. So you mirror it once and then mirror it uh, a second time so that you get everything in. So maybe we'll actually do that because it's a, a fun practice to do. So then we only need this one to be 90 in order to place it. And then we, of course, want one of the endpoints to start at the center there. So 
clicking one endpoint and moving it to the center. So now it's locked into place here. Then I actually want to create another another line, construction line. So I'm marking the construction line function because I, I'm going to need, need uh, a mirror line going up vertically also. So I'm going to let it lock in vertically. And this part up here has a radius of 40. So I can give this a length of 40 while I'm at it. Because then it's going to go all the way to the top of, of uh, the curve on top here. Now I've just zoomed in a bit. So basically what we're going to do now is to create one quarter of the plate. And for now, we're just going to create a solid plate. We're going to disregard all holes in it to begin with. So I'll start off with creating my circles. And I want a radius of 40 going around the center here. That will give me give me the top curve that I need. So I'm going to center the circle in the origo. Place it there. Now I could, could just give it a diameter of 80, or I can connect it to the top of uh, the construction line that I just created. I'm going to connect it to that one. And now I had forgotten to remove the construction line option, so now I have to do it manually. So I make sure that the circle has been marked, and then I click the construction line option just to get it back to becoming blue. And now I have to make sure to, to remove the construction line function there before I continue. Now I need to place a second circle that's going to give me the curve on the edge here, and that has a radius of 20. And for this one, the center point is going to be exactly at the end of uh, the construction line. So I'm placing this one, and it wants me to give the diameter, so I need to place in 2 times 20 to get the correct diameter for it. Press Enter. Now I've got a diameter of 40 and a diameter of 80 there. So now I exit the circle function. And now we're going to place one single line. So I go to the line function. And I'm going to attach it randomly to the large circle. And I'm going to pull it over to the other circle. And if I now start moving my mouse pointer along the circle here, it's going to, in this case, it's trying to snap it to the top of the circle, so the top point there. That's not what I want to do. I want it to become tangent with it. So I'm going to continue moving it. Might be that it doesn't want to do it. There it is. That small symbol there is a circle with a line running tangent to the circle. So if I place it here, then this line is going to be tangent with, with the circle. So I'm going to place it there. I exit the line function. Now I just need to get this end of the line to become tangent with the large circle. And then I go up to the constraints up here. So I, have, I have a constraint function that's named tangent. So that is, of course, the one that we're going to use right now. I click on the line. And then I click on the circle. And it moves the line up to become tangent with the circle.
Now we have a bit too much lines here. We, we have two complete circles. We don't need that. We just need arcs instead of complete circles. So we're going to, we're going to trim them a bit. <coughs> so we'll start off with the large circle. It will be possible for us to trim everything that's outside the two construction lines. So we go up to, up to the modify parts of the uh, toolbar. We choose the trim function. And if I go down there to the circle and hover my mouse across it, you will see that the outer three quarters are now dotted lines, while the inner quarter is a continuous line. This means that the dotted line will be cut. So that will be removed if I click my mouse button now. So now it's removed everything that was outside the two construction lines. And now I'm going to go to the inner part of the circle here. And you can see that this part is now a dotted line. But as soon as it gets to the point where the line is tangent with my curve, then it turns into a continuous line again. So that means that this inner part of the curve is going to be cut. So I click it. And now I have a line going up here. And then it goes tangent with a curve up there. We can do the same with the other circle here. So I can get it to remove this part. So I click there. But now I sort of have a problem because I have nothing telling it that I want to keep this part of the circle. There is nothing here that's cutting through, through it. So I'm going to create a small construction line again. So the line function and then I've marked the construction line because I want to place it from this point and over to the edge there of the circle. So straight out and attach it to the circle. So now I can return to the trim function and I can trim this part of the line. So now this is a dotted line, and we have a continuous line on top here. So that's going to work. So now let people have a slight chance to catch up. So now we've created the outline of one quarter of this plate. So if we now mirror it one way and then mirror the entire part uh, a second time, then we are going to get a complete plate of this one. So whether I mirror it across this way first or if I mirror it down this way, it doesn't really matter. I'm going to choose the mirror function and I'm going to click my lines. This one, that one, and this one. Because we only have three lines now. We have a curve going up here, and it's tangent with the line, but it's tangent with another curve. So only those three lines. And then I click mirror line. And I'm going to mark the lower one right now. I'm a bit unsure if it's possible to mark several mirror lines, but I don't think we're going to try that right now. And this is the one that we have to remember to press apply and not done on for some reason. So we press apply and then it creates 
half of our plate. And then I use the select again to select the now six parts of the six lines that we have going around here. And then as a mirror line, I choose the vertical construction line that I have. And when I press apply, it goes all the way out. So now I have the complete outline of my plate here. Uh, we've gotten the entire outline of the plate, so we're going to finish the sketch. I need to zoom out a bit so that we can see the sketch. Like that. And we're going to extrude the plate. So we still haven't made any holes or anything. But I'm going for extrude here, and it's supposed to be 20 millimeters thick. So I put in 20, and I hit enter. <coughs> and now I'm going to start placing the holes. So in this case, I have three holes, and the two that are on the sides, they are, uh, could be used a mirror function, but since there are only two holes, I'm just going to place them as two individual holes. That's a bit quicker, actually, than using the mirror function. <coughs> so I'm going to place holes on the sides first, and then we're going to do the middle one afterwards, because there we have to tweak it a bit more. And the fun part with this one is that we have uh, the hole is supposed to go through the center of, of this radius. And the same is for, for the middle one. We have the radius uh, of 40. 
there, so uh, it's also going to place it in the center. So we can use the concentric placement option. So concentric placement. The plane is going to be just a flat of the plate here. And then the concentric reference, since I'm creating the uh, holes on the side first, I'm going to choose the radius on one of the sides. Click this one. And then uh, my hole is placed directly in the center of that radius. The hole is also supposed to go through all. So in, my, in the termination parts of mine there, I'm just going to keep it through all because I want the hole to go all the way through. And then I have to fix the uh, diameter of the hole. And the diameter was supposed to be 20. So I put in 20 there. And then I press OK. So then I have the first hole. Now I'll place uh, a second hole on the other side. I'm just going to move this one over here so we can see it a bit better. I'll still use the concentric placement. For plane, I choose the flat of the plate. And as a concentric reference, I choose the radius on the edge there. And it remembers that my previous hole was 20 millimeters. So I don't have to switch that one uh, anyway. So I just need to press OK. And now this one has been placed. But for the middle hole here, we do have uh, a counterbore. So here we have to choose a different option when we're placing this one. So again, we're going to use the hole function up there. Again, I'm going to choose the concentric placement method. Because you remember on the, on the uh, previous plate, we used the linear one, where we placed it at certain uh, dimensions from uh, two edges. And now we're going to use the concentric, choose the flat of the plates, and I choose this small radius of 40 over here. So that's just enough to tell me where the center is, or to tell Inventor where the center is. So now it's squarely in the center there, but I only have a 20 millimeter hole going all the way through. So now I have to choose one of the other options here. So I'm going to need to select the one with counter bore like this. And now we see that I have a few more options up here. So this default option, which uh, arrived now, that's not going to work. It's going to give me an error message. Because now my counter bore at the top has a smaller diameter than the hole that's going all the way through. So that won't work. It has to be larger. And in this case, it's supposed to be 40. And then I also have to set the depth of it. And the depth is supposed to be 5. So I go down to the other one there. And I switch it to 5 millimeters. And now when I press OK, everything is done. So that was a really quickly made plate compared to the other ones that we did. We need to switch the material. This one is supposed to be stainless steel. So we'll go up to the material uh, bar up here. And we'll scroll down it until we find the stainless steel option there. I'll click that one. And then it became fairly dark. Yeah. Now I'll save my part because whether I do it manually now or if I just start a new drawing, it's going to tell me to save anyway if I just start a new drawing now. So I need to, might as well just save it right now. So what did I call this one? I called it. So it's big and small. 
I'll just call it amount, basically. So I've called mine mount in this case because this is most likely uh, going to be used to mount something, something uh, circular uh, that's going to be mounted to, to something else, maybe a hydraulic motor that's going to be mounted using this one. So I've just called it a mount. <coughs> then I can go up to the blank sheet up in the corner there, the new button. And since I've, I've just started my uh, new part and made it, it's automatically chosen the metric folder for me. I go down to the ISO IDW and I press the create button. Now I've got both my part open and my drawing, my new drawing created. So now I can just click the base view and it automatically, automatically selects my mount. And uh, now it probably remembers from the previous drawing that I wanted it to hide all of the hidden lines, to remove them from my drawing. So that one is in place. I still wanted to flip uh, the view of my mount. So I'm going to flip it up to the top so that I see it straight on here. And my mount is really small now in the drawing, so I'm going to increase it uh, in the scale. I'll go from one, 1 to 2 to 1 to 1. That will be a lot easier to, to read uh, on the drawing. And then I'll click OK. And this is a part where you, you can use hidden lines and a projected view to set it, just like is in the, the original drawing that we started out from in the beginning of, uh, of the task. Uh, but I would recommend using a section going through it, because that's going to show it way more clearly. So in order to put a section, this is the first time we're doing this. So I'm going to try to take it a bit slow, just so that I get everyone with me here. We have the section part up on the different views that we can uh, put in here. So I click the section and mark it. And now it first of all wants me to choose which view I'm going to section. So if I had several views here, I would have to click on uh, the one that I needed to section. Now I only have one option, so that's not a problem. I click on that one. And now I've got this crosshair marker. And this one is going to be, uh, place the start of my sectioning line. And I want my sectioning line to be in the middle here. So it's going to start on the outside here. It's not going to start exactly at the end, but it's going to start outside the part. And it's go going to go horizontally straight through the center of the part. And in order to get it to lock on to the center of the part, it is useful to first let it hover across the part a bit move it a bit downwards so that we get the midpoint marked green there. Then I'll move my mouse to the side here and you can see that it's creating this dotted line over to the center of the hole. This means that I am, I am still horizontally placed uh, uh, compared to the center of the hole. So placing the start of this one is a bit, uh, bit on the gut feeling basically because the the first part of the line that's going to be shown here is going to be thicker than the rest of the line. And usually you want this thick part to be outside, outside of the part itself, just to show clearly where it is. So I'm going to click down here, approximately out here somewhere. I'm going to drag my line across the part. And I'm going to make sure that it's, it has this horizontal line and then it's going straight through all three holes in my part. And then I'm going to place my mouse pointer approximately the same distance outside uh, of the part as I had in the beginning. I click once on my left mouse button. Doesn't seem like anything has happened right now. But if I start moving my mouse, you'll see 
that I've begun a new line. And that is if you're going to create several sections uh, through the same part. We're not going to do that. We are, uh, we are uh, just fine with having one line going through here. So we click the right mouse button and we choose continue. So now we get the option of uh, putting in the uh, identifier if we want. So if you put in several views and then you've deleted some of them, Inventor is going to remember what we've what views you put. So if you put in three views earlier, you will have A, B, and C. If you've deleted B, and then you place a new one, then that one is going to be named D. So that is nice to just check that you're on the next one. You don't want a drawing where you have A, C, D in, in your sections, because whoever is going to produce this part, they're going to be looking, well, where's the B section? Where is it? So they're going to use a lot of time just looking for this B section. So you want to always go alphabetically on these. So that's uh, useful to just check that you have the correct identifier there. It is also possible to change the scale of the section. In this case, there's no point in doing that, but you might want to blow it up uh, so that you can see the details in, uh, in the section more clearly. That might be, uh, be needed. So that's an option that you have here. Uh, it is also a possibility to change how cut edges uh, are shown because if you if you stop the section line inside your part, you are basically creating a cut edge there because you're not going to show the rest of your parts. So then you can you can choose if it's going to be a jagged line or if it's going to be a smooth line. But we're doing mostly complete sections when we're showing stuff. So <coughs> we use the mouse pointer to place the section itself. So I'll place it there, and as you can see, I didn't have to push the OK button or anything to place it. I just needed to click my mouse bo uh, button where I wanted the, the section to be. And here we can see that it, it's showing these hatches inside where, where it's simulating that it has uh, cut through material. <coughs> so I'm just going to give everyone a chance to catch up. A bit. Ja, det är inte i timmen. Det är ju inte problem för att Ja, det är inte Ja, det har nog sig för materialet. Det har Men Inventor tar så mycket hänsyn till det. Så Inventor kör bara på att han ska ha olika utkastar för att klara skilda material och fine. Ja, ja, ja. Så att, uh, ja, följer det helt. Om det är liksom ett detastad, det vet inte jag idag. Så i så bara på den att det var något annat ledes. Ja, ja men han följer det helt. Så, 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 vi säger att sagt att det var, var betong. Ja. Så hade han inte minst betong. Ja, okay. det, så, så han gör inte det. Men jag tror att vi skulle kunna ställa dit. Att han ska följa. Ja. Det är rätt. Det är skickliga man sätter. <laughs> So as you can see here, when I've gotten this section line up, this is the part that's extra thick on the line, on the edge, and you want that to be all the way outside. So if you're, if you're a perfectionist, you might end up uh, dragging the edge of the line just to get the uh, only the thick parts of the line outside of the part. It's, I've, I've, I've worked with colleagues that, uh, that were that, uh, had that mindset. Everything had to be completely perfect usually meant that they went way over deadlines on everything they did, but <laughs> it's, uh, it's important to keep in mind that uh, sometimes things are good enough. <laughs> it doesn't need to be completely perfect always. So we're going to put out some, uh, some center lines and some center marks uh, before we start putting in dimensions here. So I go up to the annotate one. I'll start off with the center marks for, the, for my main view here. So I'll click the center mark one. <clears throat> and I'm going to choose the outer radius here. And that didn't do what I wanted it to do. Here you actually have to choose the circle uh, to get that one shown. Uh, ideally, I would have wanted these center lines to go a bit more out there, but uh, we just uh, put them there. 
You can drag and drop to the ends of the center lines if you want to. <coughs> but for the center one here, we're, we're definitely going to choose the outside radius of the plate. And then we have to do it both on the top and the bottom. This has to do with it just being a small curve here, because it doesn't show, it doesn't show a center mark unless you have, uh, it doesn't show all four spokes of a center mark unless you have a complete circle. So as soon as you just have a, a curve, then uh, it's only going to show the one that's closest to the curve. <coughs> section itself we have we are showing you a cutout of each of the holes so there, there this just looks like a rectangle right now it doesn't uh, basically it looks like a, a quadratic rectangle <laughs> because it's 20 in all directions but it basically just looks like a square it's nothing else uh, there is nothing else showing us that this is actually curved on, on the inside so it, if we had the uh, been, uh, if it had been possible to show this with depth, we would have seen that this was a curve, so a half a uh, cylinder, basically, uh, that we had cut open. And the way that we are going to show that is to use the, uh, a center line to go through the center of it, because that shows us that this is a cylindrical uh, object. So one way of putting out the center line here would be to use the center line bisector option. And that means that you mark two lines, and it's going to put a center line between them. So I mark the edges of the hole, and then it's putting a center line through the middle of it. And this is what tells me that this is cylindrical. So having that center line there. So if you if you send this uh, drawing to to uh, to the manufacturer, they're going to of course see that. Well, here's a hole. We have a section through it. So it has to be uh, a cylinder there. But if you're if you're suddenly uh, if whoever is doing this thinks uh, highly of their apprentice and give it to their apprentice, the apprentice might not be able to distinguish this. So if he's fresh off from school or something, uh, he might not have, uh, have enough experience to see it. So that's why we use it to show very clearly that this is a cylindrical object. So we do the same on the other side. And what we can do now for the, for the middle is I can choose each of these ones but then my center line won't go all the way through because the lines only go 15 millimeters. They don't go all 20 millimeters of the plate thickness. So there I'm instead going to use the regular center line option. And I'm going to mark the top of the center hole. And then I'm going to mark the bottom of the center hole. And then as you can see, as I move my mouse pointer here, it wants to continue the center line, but I'm going to click the right mouse button and set create, because that's when I've actually placed this line. <clears throat> so now we'll start uh, doing a couple of the dimensions here. The nice thing is with this uh, center mark we have uh, in the middle hole, it also tells us that it's symmetrical on both sides. So it's fairly easy to see that everything is the same, only mirrored on the other side. So we can do all of our dimensions with regards as if this was a regular symmetry line that was shown. <coughs> so I'm choosing the dimension option. I'm fixing the format right away over to 1B. And then I'm going to set 
the dimension from this center mark to that center mark, just to get the length of it. And I'm putting it down to 180. And in the original drawing here, I put in a special tolerance on this one. So I'm going to show you how to, how to do this. So if we want this one to be something other than the general tolerances that we're going to put in here at the end uh, of creating our drawing, we will go to the next tab here, Precision and Tolerance. And here we have a lot of different options. One of the things that we can do, uh, uh, just to show that, we have the precision part here. So that if you are giving just a general dimension, so from, from the edges, uh, the two edges of uh, a complete part, for an example, just to show how big this is going to be with regards to getting it into a crate or moving it around or something. And you get like, maybe this is uh, approximately 1.2 meters. So you get 1201.92 millimeters or something. Then you can actually use the primary unit there and you can remove all of the decimal points. So then it's going to just show 1201 millimeters. It's not going to show the point something because that would be completely irrelevant uh, in such a drawing. In this case, we're going to, to uh, let it be because it's not showing our decimal points as long as they are zeros anyway. <coughs> And then we have the different tolerance methods here. So I have, we have many ways of telling uh, different tolerances for this one. So I'm just going to go through a couple of them to show. And you have the one that's named reference. And that's not a tolerance in itself, but as you can see down here, we have suddenly got a parenthesis around our number. So that one is to show if you have to put in, uh, or if you feel that it is necessary to put in the same dimension in two different places in the same drawing. The first place where you put it in is going to be the regular dimension. And if you have to show it once more, you will put uh, this reference on it so that it's inside a parenthesis. Because then whoever is manufacturing will know that this one is just for additional information. I'm supposed to go uh, after this first one that doesn't have the parenthesis. So that's a way of using the reference dimension there. You have one that is called symmetric and that is the one that we are going to use afterwards. And you see I get a plus minus symbol and then I can put in a value here if I want to. We're going to do that afterwards. You also have the one that's named deviation. So then I get plus a value and minus a value. And I can change around on them up here. So I can click it so that I get minus minus and I can get plus plus on all of them also. So here you can set if you're, if you're not going to do a regular plus minus tolerance oh, if you want everything to be shifted to, to the positive side, for an example, then you can do that. <clears throat> then you have maximum and minimum options, where you get max and min. Then it's going to use, uh, whoever is manufacturing it, is going to use the general tolerance that is given down here, but the general tolerance that is given down there is a plus minus one, so it goes both on the positive side and the negative one. So if you use the minimum option there, you are going to still use the same range. So if it's plus minus 0 0.2, that means that the total range is 0 0.4. So 0 0.2 on the minus side, 0 0.2 on the plus side. So they're just going to shift it then so that everything goes on to the uh, plus side so that it becomes 0 to plus 4 instead of being plus minus 2, 0 0.2. So <clears throat> that's a way of, uh, of also setting them. And then you have uh, if you have a hole and a shaft that's going to fit into the hole, you have these uh, these different options where you can put in. Uh, the, the capital letter is for a hole. And if you're putting in a, uh, a lowercase letter before it, that's a shaft instead. <clears throat> and here you have different, uh, different options. You can see we have stacked, linear, show size limits and show tolerance. And that's just what it's going to show behind it. So it's giving the, the designation for the ISO standard for it. But it's, can, you can also choose to show the tolerance there. You can just show it as just an H7. That would mean that 
whoever is manufacturing this actually has to go into their metal trades handbook. They have to look at the table, find H7, see it's 180, and then they have to find the correct place in the table, and then they know what the tolerance is going to be. So often, just to, just to be, be a nice guy when you're creating technical drawings, it's nice to use this one, because then you actually have the, this one uh, directly there. Now, in this particular case, we're going to use the symmetric one up top here. And we're going to put in plus minus 0 0.2. And then we click OK. So now we have plus minus 0 0.2 behind our 180 length. And that's it for today. So we actually got uh, even further than I was hoping. I was hoping that we would just start the drawing, but we actually got to do quite a lot on the drawing also. So that's very good work. <coughs> so I'll uh, see you all tomorrow in the hydraulics class. <laughs>